of course, a recent NASA collaboration that everybody's been celebrating is the Webb Telescope, JWST. And seeing images like this, this glorious image of this galaxy, and this is uh, Webb data combined with Hubble data, and there's the Hubble data on its own. You can see the, the change there you get. The resolution is just a lot greater. Now, of course, we're seeing in the infrared, this is not a visible light image. It's at least not just a visible light image. So there's more to it than just that. This beautiful image of the tarantula nebula, actually, that you can see here. Um, there's the tarantula for Halloween. <laughs> that. Um, and the tarantula nebula is actually part of the large Magellanic cloud. So seeing a nebula that beautiful, that glorious, that's in an external dwarf galaxy that orbits the Milky Way, there it is a little bit closer. And if my memory serves correctly, the tarantula nebula is up in this region. I think it's the bright mm -hmm. spot right there, mm -hmm. the brightest. It's known as 30 Doradus, and it is a star-forming region and would be an interesting target for, for the Webb telescope. So I get why they're doing it, or at least I think I do. Uh, they released this image of Neptune, which made me wonder, is this for Halloween as well, since Neptune, <laughs> Neptune is a little ghost? Um, you know, hey, how do I look today? Uh, let's, you know, why don't I my new telescope pitch? You look okay, I guess. Try switching it to infrared mode. So, whoa, so yay, Neptune, for looking so amazing in the infrared. <laughs> But it did get me thinking, um, what is really different about these infrared views than what we see in the visible light? And I thought I would uh, ask one of our wonderful producers, Sarah Vincent, to uh, take this on and uh, tell us a little bit about how the web is different and what we're seeing in some of these images. Hi, Sarah. Hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah, well, welcome. So I can't wait to hear a little bit more about this and uh, take it away. Let's hear what... Uh, what you discovered about JWST. Awesome. And before I get going, I can confirm it is JPL building Europa Clipper. I have the t-shirt. <laughs> okay, good, good. I thought it was, but I didn't want to offend any Goddard folks that might oh. be out there watching. <laughs> it's all the NASA family. Everybody's fine. <laughs> yeah, they, they would be, but uh, JPL is local though. Maybe we can get somebody from that mission to come say hello to us in person. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, so with the JWST, we get to see the world in a different light. Uh, I That's see. right, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, as Dr. Reitzel told you, this is the Tarantula Nebula, aka 30 Doradus, aka the Tarantella, because I'm going to slip up and say that, I promise. So, <laughs> this image, as we're seeing it, is a near cam image. So it's the near infrared, which that means it, it's uh, the wavelengths that are closest to the visible light, but just a little bit longer. Um, so in this image, you can see all the rusty colored parts of the images. That is complex hydrocarbons within the nebula. And you've got these stars that have the soon to be as familiar uh, dif uh, diffraction spikes we're really familiar with Hubble's four spikes. JWST is treating us with eight. <laughs> so double the, double the diffraction, double the fun. Anyway, so when we move to the Miri image, we see the basically the same star. Oh, now it's giving me the laser pointer. Fancy. All right. So we see basically the same structures but this time they're in blue. So what was rust colored in near cam, they have colored in blue for this image. Part of the reason for that is these are, these are false color images. They are, uh, you choose the color that you want to enhance the feature of the image that you are studying. And in this case with 30 Doradus, it's the dust that's important. All right, so to uh, really demonstrate that, I've got this side-by-side -side image. You can really see the structures where they sit next to each other, where, the, where they're really, uh, we're seeing the same structures just in different images, different colors. Okay, let me try that sentence again. But one of the biggest differences between these two images, aside from the color, uh, is the intensity of the stars. In the near cam image on the left, we have a bunch of baby stars, bouncing baby stars. They're blue white, they're really hot stars. They've just blown away the gas that birthed them. Uh, they're hot they're, young stars, you would say? 
I was hoping you would jump in with that. <laughs> I was like, pick up my cue, dude. <laughs> a long time all space viewers will enjoy that throwback. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> all right. So the uh, hot young stars, they are uh they're dominating this near cam image but when we move over to the miri image it's almost as if they've disappeared the diffraction spikes are significantly reduced and the reason for that is miri is looking at the mid infrared it's farther away from the maximum output of these stars these hot young stars and what's taking center stage is the dust and the dust of the tarantula nebula is what's so so cool about it because, okay, <laughs> the chemical makeup of the tarantula nebula is similar to what was found in what's called the cosmic noon. So approximately two to three billion years, PBB or post Big Bang. <laughs> I won't acronym again, but have fun with that if you like it. So two to three billion years after the Big Bang, the universe has been forming galaxies and forming stars at a ferocious rate. And we've got a stabilizing structure uh, happening. The, the galaxies that have formed, they've been collapsing, they've been coalescing, they've been doing what galaxies do and they're baby galaxies. Now that, that's the cosmic dawn. Now we've entered the cosmic noon and They've got supermassive black holes in their cores. They're starting to form structures that we're familiar with. And these are the galaxies that we look at when we're looking back at two uh, at redshift of approximately two to three Z, which is a really fun term. Don't worry about it. Two to three billion years after the birth of the universe. The chemical makeup of the tarantula nebula is similar to that time period but not similar to the star forming regions that we can see in our galaxy. So we've got this pocket of almost historical <laughs> gas and dust sitting right there in clear view of our super fancy new infrared telescope that is designed to study dust. So we're super excited for the science that's going to be coming out of <laughs> the Tarantula Nebula and its dust. And just for fun, because this nebula is so pretty, this is a Hubble image just, just for scale, because it's amazing. And uh, I like to treat everybody with pretty pictures, because who doesn't? I'm sorry, Katie, I'm stepping on you. Uh, all right, but this one, this is a really fun system called VV191. Yes, it rolls off the tongue. I am sure you will be saying this at your next dinner party. Okay, this system was found by the uh, Galaxy Zoo citizen scientists. This, this set of galaxies, I should say, this system, it was identified because of what's happening right here. They realized in using Hubble data, they realized that this the spiral galaxy is sitting in front of a really bright elliptical galaxy. It's backlighting the dust. Oh. <laughs> and that means when you have a super fancy space telescope designed to study space dust, you're going to look at VV191. Okay, so what's the point of looking at galactic space dust? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. With the backlight of the elliptical galaxy, you'll be able to look at the structure of the dust within the spiral galaxy, kind of like taking an x-ray of a human body. You can see where the bones are, you can see where the breaks are, you can see where the even, even the tissue is in some x-rays. You can see lungs, a denser tissue. By the difference, uh, by the different ways the, the x-rays are absorbed by the tissues or in the bones, same thing happens with galactic dust to the full spectrum of the galaxy behind it. So we look at the, the bits of dust that this spiral galaxy steals from the light of the, of the elliptical galaxy behind it. And that'll give us more information about the structure of this ever so pretty galaxy, which then we will extrapolate back to our own Milky Way structure, helping us better understand our home. And just because 
the JWST is the gift that keeps on giving. While they were looking at this really pretty spiral galaxy sitting in front of an elliptical, they saw, oh, wait, is that? Yes, it's a lensed galaxy just sitting there <laughs> in the data. The, uh, the Hubble data had uh, uh, is too far into the visible. It didn't, it doesn't, Hubble doesn't have enough infrared uh, capability to see this lensed galaxy. It is, the lensed galaxy is so red shifted that it was basically noise in the Hubble data. So when they started looking at this system of galaxies, for one thing, they found, oh, here's a present <laughs> of, uh, of more lens galaxies. And lens galaxies are important. Why? Because they tell us about potential dark matter structures within the galaxies that are doing the lensing. All right. <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> we bring it a little bit, a little bit back closer to home, as we like to do. And this, this is Neptune. As we saw earlier, this is a near, con a near cam image of our farthest planetary neighbor, the uh, eighth planet. And it's the best picture that we have gotten of Neptune since Voyager 2 flew by. And if you don't believe me, here is one of Voyager 2's best images, modern processing, of course, of uh, uh, Neptune. Okay, so this image was from 1989 when Voyager 2 flew by. That is the only craft that has ever visited Neptune. We need to go back. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, but. That, and that's just a gorgeous color of blue. It, it really, really is. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh. I just. I, I actually kind of got a little bit mesmerized and uh, thanks for bailing me out. All right. Now we do have another super powerful space telescope, Hubble. It is designed for doing different things. This is the best image that Hubble can do of Neptune. Uh, this is an image from 2021, so very recent. Um, and when you look at it, you, you can see the dark spot. You can kind of see that there might be bright streakiness in there. But one thing that's definitely missing is those rings. Oh my goodness, those rings. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's rings in 1989 with that, that lone flyby. This is the first time we've seen them since. <laughs> they are spectacular and we know so very little about them. It's awesome that we're going to get to study them even more in better, in more detail on, our, uh, on a lo longer term basis <laughs> than the Voyager 2 flyby. We had just a few moments in the presence of Neptune and then Voyager 2 was on its way out of the solar system. Now with JWST and our ability to study the ring system in one full image, we're gonna get more data. And oh, by the way, we can see moons within this ring system. This is incredible and I was looking at this image and I was like, why, why, oh, why? <laughs> what, what is happening at the top of this image? Why are there diffraction spikes sticking in? And also, <laughs> like, if you've, got, if you've got time to plan your shot, why would you capture the edge of a star? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering that too. Right? We, we, we back it up here and, and look, what's the big blue star that was in the image there? It's it's this bright thing. That's that's what I thought at first. And then um of course, of course, folks, it's uh Oh my gosh. It's Triton. <laughs> it's Triton. That's not a star, it's a moon. <laughs> it's a moon, exactly. That's no moon. Anyway, that is a moon. Um, it is a moon. <laughs> now, my, my question to you, Sarah, is why is Neptune so darn faint? It's ghostly faint. Um, and why is Triton boomingly bright like that? What the heck's going on there? <laughs> why is Triton screaming at us in infrared? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Uh, Triton is ever so shiny and Neptune is made of methane which is really absorbent in the infrared and JWST is an infrared telescope and therefore it sucks up all of the information that JWST was trying to get. So uh, Neptune, Triton, they don't emit 
they are not light sources. They are reflecting sunlight back at us. Triton reflects 70% of the sunlight that, it, that hits it. Neptune is fairly reflective in the visible. You've seen the, you saw those blue pictures. It's so pretty, uh, but it absorbs red and infrared so very well because of that methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas. It, uh, it is 25 times more uh, absorbent of, the inf of infrared than carbon dioxide. It's just... Yeah, well, it's are, those, are those clouds that we're seeing there <laughs> at the, the bottom of the image um, that are the bright spots? They are. White clouds, okay. They are also clouds of methane, which might make you wonder why is meth if methane absorbs infrared, what's it doing bouncing it back? They're ice. So the clouds are high atmosphere methane ice clouds, and that means they are reflecting the infrared back before it gets a chance to be absorbed by Neptune's methane rich atmosphere. It's nice to get a new portrait of a solar system family member, so to speak. And uh, it's appropriately ghost, ghostly for this Halloween season. So <laughs> now, how many different filters were used in this? I see them listed down below. Um, so how many different images did they have to take to make this colorful image? Because I'm seeing a lot of color in it. They use the four filters that are listed below. There are more filters that are available. Uh, if you can, if you would like to process these images yourself, you can play with them. The data is online. Um, but these four that you can see down at the bottom, they have color coded the filter, which is the, um, it'll say W if it's a wide or uh, N if it's a narrow. But anyway, it tells you the frequency. It tells you the, uh, the mm -hmm. wavelength. I was doing it again. <laughs> it tells you the wavelength of the light that that filter was allowing through to the sensor. And they color it specifically in this instance to try to uh, recreate visible the visible light spectrum so that it feels familiar to our eyes. This one is not necessarily a science image. This is a uh, make it feel relatable image. So the colors are RGB. Uh, with a little bit of uh, yellow in there just for fun. <laughs> well, fascinating stuff. And I know we have plans to um, do what uh, Patrick has done in the past, where uh, mm -hmm. he showed off how to process some of those Juno images and some Hubble images at times. And I know, Sarah, you have plans to try and help folks uh, learn how to process these JWST images. So I stay tuned for that, do. folks. Um, we'll be bringing that to you on our YouTube channel at a future time, but it is something that I know we want to do. So thank you so much for that report. It's fascinating seeing these different aspects of the infrared uh, images and how they compare to the Hubble ones. So more to come, folks. And thank you so much for the report, sir. Much appreciated.